Welcome to A Flame for Christ, homilies to set your hearts on fire with love for Jesus Christ. My name is Father Joseph Gill, priest of the Diocese of Bridgeport, Connecticut, and you've joined us on this 15th Sunday of Ordinary Time. So when I was growing up, my family loved to go camping. You know, we started out with this old canvas tent, probably weighed about 100 pounds, and any time it rained, you had to be careful, because if you ever touched the inside of the tent, water would just start pouring through that, uh, that canvas. Then, after that, we got a pop-up camper, which we had to crank to set up, and you had to drag out the beds, and it wasn't always the most comfortable, but definitely a step up from that, uh, that little tent. And then finally, finally, my parents bought an RV, complete with TV, air conditioning, a microwave. That's not camping. That's glamping, glamour camping. You know, and in my opinion, that's a bit of an overkill for something that you're only going to be using for a couple days at a time. I mean, ultimately, it's just a temporary shelter. It's not your home. But I think that's the way in which a lot of people live their lives. They do overkill for things that are only temporary. You know, St. Therese of Lisieux said, The world is our ship and not our home. It's our ship and not our home. And a temporary shelter like a tent should be comfortable enough, but not so comfortable that we want to remain there forever because we're not finished our journey yet. And so in the same way, we're on a journey to heaven and this world is only our ship and shouldn't be so comfortable that we want to stay here forever. Last week, we considered St. Paul's insights in the battle between the flesh and the spirit. And today, he continues that same kind of discussion by discussing the world and the spirit. You know, what is our relationship with the world? Well, like the flesh, the world is also good, but it's fallen. Now, okay, so we can understand why the flesh is fallen, right? Because we're human, but why is the world fallen since it didn't do anything wrong? Well, the truth is, back in the beginning, all the way when God created man and woman, he created us to be the guardians and stewards of this earth. God put Adam and Eve in the garden to take care of it, to rule it in his name. And so when we sinned, we gave away the keys to the Garden of Eden, ultimately, and we gave them away to the evil one. And since then, as St. Paul says, all of creation is subject to futility, its groaning and labor pains. So ever since the fall, death and chaos and suffering entered the world. And I think we deal with this on a regular basis, right? I mean, have you ever been frustrated by a car breaking down? or joints creaking when you get out of bed, or maybe an unexpected tax bill, or your computer freezing up at the worst possible moment. You know, we kind of have an intuition that that's not how the world is supposed to work. And there's a principle in science called the principle of entropy. And entropy basically means that the universe tends towards chaos and disorder. I mean, consider, is it easier to clean something or to make a mess? Well, judging by the state of my car, it's far easier to make a mess, right? And so in this world that's so full of disorder, chaos, mess, brokenness, suffering, and pain, I think it's easy enough to understand what St. Paul is talking about. This world will never be a utopia. As good as it is, it's never going to be perfect. And so we may try to pass more laws, more policies, more bumper stickers, and more Instagram posts talking about kindness, but the truth is that it's not going to make this world perfect. You know, despite what the song says, we really don't build the kingdom of God. It's God himself who brings the kingdom at the end of time when all things are renewed and restored to their original glory. Now, does that mean, though, that we should just simply like watch the world go to heck in a handbasket? Well, no, not at all. In fact, as Christians, we're called to make the world a better place, but with an eye to eternity. And I think of a great example are the two great missionaries of the church, Saints Cosmos and Damien. They were both brothers and doctors. And they embraced Christianity and decided to bring souls to Christ in a rather unique way. They decided that they were going to offer their medical services without payment. And this so shocked the people of Syria back in the third century that they gained the nicknames the moneyless ones. And people were so intrigued by that lack of greed that they began to ask why. And the brothers then had the opportunity to share the gospel with them, and they gained many converts through that. They made this world a better place, but also with an eye to eternity. And there's the key. We use this world with an eye to eternity. You know, in Homer's famous poem, Odyssey, the character Odysseus is trying to return home after a very long and trying journey. And he sailed all across the Mediterranean Sea, and at a certain point, his men stop off at the island of the Lotus Eaters, where the inhabitants ate the lotus flower, which brought them to a state of contented apathy. And so some of Odysseus's men get off the boat, and they eat the flower too, and they suddenly forget any urgency in their journey. They decide to stay instead of heading home, and so Odysseus had to actually force his men back to the ship to continue the journey. And I think so many Christians are like that. They're so taken in with the things of this world that they forget that they're on a journey headed home. 
And so we've eaten the lotus flowers, and suddenly we're content where we are, when in reality we should be restless. As St. Augustine said so beautifully, you've made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. We should never find our rest in the things of this world, but there should always be a restlessness, knowing that we were made for so much more. So what must we do then? Well, we use this world without clinging to it. Our bank accounts, our house, our job, our talents, our relationships are only good insofar as they advance us along the journey to our true home, which is eternity. You know, not too long ago, a high-powered lawyer by the name of Dale Resinella and his wife had just built their dream house, millions and millions of dollars they poured into this home, when they happened to step into Mass one morning, and the gospel featured Jesus saying how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. And that night, Dale was rather disturbed and asked his wife, do you think that Jesus really meant what he said there, that it's really hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God? And so they decided to pray on it and came back in six months to reevaluate. And six months later, Dale and his wife decided that, well, actually, yeah, Jesus really did mean what he said, that it's very hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And it was kind of, Jesus was telling them they had to choose between their multi-million dollar house and his kingdom. But they kind of dallied. They did nothing about it. They're like, well, let's put off that decision a little longer. You know, we're kind of really enjoying our dream house. So about a year later, Dale found himself mysteriously in the hospital with a high fever. And doctors tried all sorts of tests to try to figure out what it is. And it found out that he had eaten some raw oysters that contained deadly flesh-eating bacteria. And the doctors told him there was nothing they could do. They had 12 hours to live. And so that night, as he prepared for death, he fell into a coma. And he recounts that he woke, he awoke in this coma. He actually had a, a vision of Christ. And he was alone with the ru- in the room with Jesus. And our Lord said to him, what have you done with the gifts that I've given you? And he began to be defensive, saying, well, you know, I sent my kids to the best school and made sure my family was financially secure. And Jesus just looked at him and said, what about all my people who are suffering? So much to everyone's surprise, Dale actually woke up the next morning. He was expected to be dead, but by God's grace and miracle, he survived that really rough night. And he immediately convinced his wife to sell that dream house and to start giving their money away to charities. So he began to volunteer full-time, ministering to prisoners on death row, bringing them the hope of Jesus Christ. And all of the sufferings he had to undergo after that point, you know, from his illness to giving up his dream life, really are nothing compared to the glory of that God is doing in him in the fact that he's bringing so many men in, on death row hope in Jesus Christ. He had all these gifts, material gifts, and now they're putting, he's putting them to use, bringing other souls closer to the kingdom with him. My friends, we walk through this world, enjoying it responsibly and seeking to improve it, but not being distracted by its glitter, but rather keep on moving towards eternity. After all, this world is only our ship and not our home.